So we have the, the of course, great pleasure of having Monty and David here, who has made money with open source. We have also the honor of having Peter Seitzel, uh, one who has really also been able to commercialize open source <laughs> present today. Uh, so, so uh, I will talk a bit from different angles on the topic. Uh, maybe first a bit of a traditional one, and then then some some provocative thoughts uh, as a venture capitalist. Uh, so, short, first short introduction. Then, let's say the open source view. Uh, I will openly admit that that here in kind of open source spirit, I have uh, borrowed some slides from Monty. Monty has a long 30, 40 slide session uh, presentation on open source, which where I, I borrowed some selected slides from. Then a few case studies, and and then a bit of the VC investor view from my perspective. Um, so a bit few words about Open Ocean. So we're a VC firm. We invest in early stage startups, mostly in Europe in data software. Uh, we typically invest in, in early stages, three to six million euros. So typically then there's a product out and has some traction, and then we come in and help the founder scale and build businesses. We have uh, scaled a couple of businesses to 100 millions uh, in revenue. So a few success stories already, a few unicorns. Uh, there, a few in the making, hopefully soon to be so-called unicorns, um, and, and, and so forth. So we have about 300 million uh, euros under management in a number of funds that have been doing really well. So, so uh, uh, happy about that, of course. And indeed, my background, I was in 2003 joining, joining MySQL. I was five, six years with the company, a few years back, part of the management team. So working with uh, a number of people in this room. Uh, and then, then after that, uh, a co-founder of MariaDB, so well, and Monty, uh, Monty uh, of course, started uh, forking and working with the team on the MariaDB server, uh, together with Ralph and a number of others, Sky and so forth. We worked on the business side of things, uh, creating business plans, raising funding, uh, uh, recruiting the first team, and so forth. So, so, so we have a background, indeed, from, from MariaDB as, as well. So then to the more open source view. This is, so to say, for a founder thinking about going open source. Why should I go open source? Uh, one is, of course, to spread the product more quickly, getting more users. Uh, one is to get development also potentially done elsewhere, as uh, lower cost, uh, typically getting higher quality, you get more tested, more reports, uh, and so forth. All right. Uh, also, uh, you know, getting uh, potentially development done in things that you're not focusing on. Indeed, the community can extend, expand the product in different directions that they feel important. Uh, it might be easier to find good developers. I remember in the early days, of course, Monty and, and David, they recruited people from wherever they happened to find them in the community, wherever in the world, uh, which partly also contributed to my scale in the days. And we're really even also uh, to be kind of virtual, distributed, uh, even around the globe. Um, of course, you, get, you can easily get more market recognition when the, if there's a lot of usage awareness out there, a stronger retired trademark uh, to then benefit, uh, you know, in, in whatever commercial efforts you might have. Um, and generally, indeed, more feedback, better bug reports. Um, by the way, here I will say that, that I do encourage all of you to interrupt if you have some views points or even of views uh, on, on, on things. Uh, so why choose open source software if you're kind of a user? Well, typically they use open standards, so you don't get locked into some proprietary standards. Uh, you know, it's lower cost. Typically, often it's free. Better documentation, better support, better quality. Uh, a lot of benefits uh, for you if, if you can find the right so you say, software in the open source uh, space. Uh, so. Some of the good and the bad, uh, open source generally regarded as a better way to develop software, to get more developer spread, testing, better code, and also enable companies to use that code to flexibly develop further upon. However, I must say it's very hard to create a, a profitable or large uh, revenue company. It's, it's, it can be tough to, to get money, to pay developers, it might be hard to get money and, and sort of say investors also to, to join. And, and, and I can say as, as, as a VC investors, of course, in Europe, we see, uh, you know, over the last 10 years, we've probably seen a 
many hundreds of open source initiatives, even a thousand, and, and many of them are indeed, you can see that yes, you can make some money maybe on them, but it's really hard to project that can you do a lot of money, and I will come to that a bit later. So what business model to choose? The easiest part is actually the first one, services company. Uh, you can have manually powered services, you can provide some support, you can provide training, consulting, help in different ways. However, as a kind of capitalist with a capitalist uh, investor head uh, on me, typically the valuation is low. So 2x revenue uh, is a ballpark for generally kind of advisory companies doing support and, 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 and training and, and, and so forth. Whereas if you're a software company actually selling software, then the valuation can get this much, much higher. There's a long analysis of why this is the case, but, but it's about also the longevity and the efficient, efficiency of the business model, the margins you can make, and, 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 and so forth. But this is generally the rule of thumb. And, and uh, of course, there's companies that are a mix of the two. I believe that, that Carcona already has some own software as well that they, they commercialize in, as a combination, in combination with services. Right? Yes. Well, revenue is usually a cost of a company, but how is it connected with the, the size of investment? The size of investment, or in which regard you mean? As an investor or as a size of investment into, into I mean, typically a company invests in personnel and well, what employees. What do you say 10x revenue? Do you mean it's investments or...? 10x the next on the revenue, I mean the valuation in the market, how, sorry, the valuation is kind of what a, if someone would buy in the company, or if you would list it on a stock exchange, what is the company worth? So that is the valuation. So this is how you would put the price on a company. If it's a consultancy company in the market, you typically only pay two times the revenue. Whereas if it's a software product company, in pure product revenue, it's high margin business that you are often ready to pay a much higher valuation for. Yeah, so I'll give you an example. So uh, my school was sold to uh, for one billion. We had a 7 billion in revenue valuation with US valuation of 700,000. Uh, so, sorry, uh, valuation of 700 billion, but we also have 50 or 100 million users. So, that allows us to get the valuation of from 700 to 1 billion. Yeah, but if you would look. So, maybe we have some 100 million users. That, 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 that increased the valuation of that period. Okay. As an example. So anyway, in, in, as a end comment here, to succeed big time, if you have a popular open source product, you really want, must force users to pay somehow. Then there's a number of licenses. I will not go into licensing discussions too deeply, but there's a, a variety, variety of, of different licenses for public domain. Anyone can use the open source software in anything and, and for free, free and, and, and even build stuff on it and sell further. And then there's an uh, increasing level of, of restric restriction, so to say. Uh, AGPL is quite a popular one nowadays because then kind of if you, uh, if someone takes it and hosts the service online, they actually have to pay, uh, they cannot do that under AGPL restrictions. Um, so for instance, Mongo did use that in the early days before moving to their own other license. Um, then a number of business models to use with open source Open core is quite common out there. You have an open source core, but then you have closed source features uh, around it, uh, on top of it, so to say that, that if you need those features, you want those features, you need that value from those features, you have to pay. Uh, but, but if you, you can use the core freely yours, uh, open, well, under the open source license. Uh, then there's a dual licensing model. This is quite a peculiar one. I mean, at the MySQL days, and I still own the IP of the server, the community server, and therefore uh, my school could choose that, hey, we can give the same code GPL with GPL restrictions, but also with commercial license to use to be used by customers however they want. So, so, so actually kind of just licensing the same piece of software in two different ways, commercially and then uh, open source. And, and, and business source is a way, it's actually a form of, of closed source uh, license, but it has a delayed open source logic into it, so that after a few years it becomes open source. And, and then there's a, uh, some further ones here, of course services model is, is, is a very common one, you sell services and things around, and subscriptions that you combine, support, uh, product lifetime extension, kind of guaranteed updates for it, uh, plus then commercial features if you have them. 
Then you can also have, indeed, non-profit foundation, as, as we all know in this room, or, or even donations. In the early days, Monty got, and they, they got checks on the, in, in, in envelopes that keep on going, Monty and David. So a few case studies. So looking at, at this is now the VC perspective, and you notice from the graphics that this is now the Open Ocean team has done this, and it's not Monty graphics anymore. Oh, so, <laughs> so, so, so we, we, this is from our team, they had a quick look at me. Who has really made money, and really making money from VC perspective, when we invest, and we invest in the early stage, but you know, typically, I said, three to six million in the first step, then a company is typically valued at tens of some, 10 to maybe 30 million in valuation when we invest. Then of course, as venture capital investors, we want the best ones to succeed, to go even to a billion dollar in valuation. And that typically requires doing 100 million. So, so in revenue. So to get to 100 million revenue, who have done it in the open source space, there's actually remarkably few. And, and, and there's, I mean, millions of open source projects out there. There's probably 10,000 wanting to do a business, or so around open source, but only a handful has actually managed to do a, a really big business with uh, open source. So, so the best, biggest examples, Red Hat, Elastic, and MongoDB, over a billion in, in, in revenue. Uh, Hitler, Fashion Corp, Confluent, and so forth, uh, those, those three, 500 million or more, and then, then uh, the four ones who have done 100 million or more. So, so, so quite, quite, quite a privileged uh, group here, uh, really. And mostly, as you see, it's kind of infrastructure. That's where, where open source really shines, both, both from people who want to adopt uh, the, the, the product, but also when you commercialize. That's, that's where, where it, it, you can find ways to commercialize in a, in a good way. So a few, I mean, a bit looking at a few examples. So MongoDB. Uh, it was, of course, a free and open source product in the beginning, but then gradually what they built was a cloud product service uh, that then uh, a lot of the users moved to for simplicity, for convenience, and, 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 and so forth, and, and happy to, to pay for that. Uh, a few more. Uh, GitLab is specifically annoying. I will take it as a case, case example because Monty and, and me were, were actually down in in, in, in uh, the Netherlands, I met with Sips, the founder of GitLab, and we were discussing about investing when they had a 10, 10 million valuation. Now it's valued somewhere between 5 and 10 billion at least. So, so at the moment, we hadn't money to uh, really to put, put in, and we considered that maybe in a few months, but then we were too late. So, so we actually gave a lot of advice on how to commercialize, and uh, I'm very glad that Sips, the founder, managed to commercialize, but we were not an investor. So, so that's a, a bit of a pain, pain for us at Open Ocean. But, but uh, so those things happen at times. Luckily, we have fun, found other good investments to do so. Uh, but then, I mean, who else is making money on, on open source software? And actually, the ones who are almost most making money are the big cloud vendors. So, so mostly, I mean, they use a lot of, of open source software. Uh, I mean, Facebook, YouTube, so forth. A lot of these have been built using, I mean, they even run MySQL instances in the, I don't know, 10, 10 or hundreds of thousands, and, and pay very, very little. But then, of course, they commercialize to the market and make a lot of money. So, so that's a bit of an, uh, annoying from, from a kind of open source perspective to be blunt here and a bit provocative. That, that for instance, AWS was estimated to be making 800 million uh, on managed services, much built on free open source, and they really pay very little for it. <laughs> so, so I think there was an uh, Amazon representative here. <laughs> but, but uh, feel free to comment if, if you want. But this is this is just you know if, if you're brutal, so to say, you say that they are in a way leeching on the open source uh, value and, and making money themselves on it, and, and that's 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 allowed, of course, according to the licenses. And however, that has led to the fact that that many are moving. There, many have learned about this and seeing this and moving to to more restrictive licenses. And, and we have even in our portfolio a couple of, of really hot open source companies building, building commercial cloud offerings and, 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 and so forth, but also moving to more restrictive licenses because otherwise others, others will, will build easily businesses around it and that constrains what, what you as an independent company can do. 
Has that had any impact on the growth and so on you, that you can see? Not not really. I mean, it's it, of course it hits a bit at some in some cases. I mean, in, in the Terraform, what was it? Hashi Corp, I mean, there was a backlash and, and so forth and so forth and so forth. But in the end, uh, in most cases, it actually has gone remarkably well. So in, in, in one specific company I'm thinking of, and, and, and the board of, uh, there, there was actually no impact. But it's in the early stages. So when it's quite early stage and you move from GPL to AGPL, most don't care. Uh, but you would care then when, you know, for instance, another would have taken the, 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 the GPL code and made their own managed service uh, at a later point in time when the, when the product is very popular and, and, and so forth. So, so if you do it in the, at the right point in time, uh, it's easier. Okay, so then a bit of a provocative VC investor view on all of this. So what do open source users want? And, and uh, this is like my 20 year background and experience. They really want free stuff. And, and, and even I remember the conferences and whatnot in, in my scale days 20 years ago, and it's probably still the same. Most questions come from users out there and asking, oh, how, how can I just keep on using it for free? And I don't want to pay. And if there's some restriction, how can I get around it? And what can I do not to pay? And so forth. There's a lot of voices about it. But, but actually, those who, who get a lot of, kind of companies getting value of it often are ready to pay. Uh, but this is often what, what, not, what you, not what you hear in the community by the users. The vocal users are those who want it free. And, and they want no lock-in, they want, of course, the open sourcingness they like, that there's theoretically ability to, to things, do things yourself. They want things to be high quality performance, uh, maintained for many years, uh, bug fixed, uh, security alerts, all of this. But uh, coincidentally, this is also what the big kind of cloud players want. So Amazon also wants all of this and not pay anything. <laughs> and Net is a service provider. We know, for instance, very well a company called Ivan. They're soon at 100 million revenue. They use a lot of open source databases, but they don't pay anything for it. And they're very happy with that. So, so <laughs> I, you know, I, I would also be, unfortunately, I'm not an investor in Ivan either, but, but I would, would, would have wanted to be. But, but um, anyway. Uh, that's, that's really the, there's a, there's a lot of people making a lot of money on open source, but preferably they don't want to pay. Patrick, what is no, what do you mean by no lock-in? Because if you use something, you automatically lock in. Well, lock-in, the lock-in is yes, in, in the context of if you are, if you're locked into a commercial vendor, the classical example is Oracle, of course, that, that for now 30, 40, 40 years now, soon, maybe even longer, uh, you know, if you have everything tied to Oracle database, you cannot really move from there. And then Oracle knocks on your door every year and say, oh, let's look at your servers and let's look at your pricing. And then they increase your prices by 10% every year. And you get furious and furious, more furious every day. But you can't do anything about it. Uh, except that you get Monty at, at DBS to migrate to Miami. The service that I say that to be able to continue using that, you have to pay the next time. And you can't do anything. That's yeah. So the Oracle MySQL example is very easy. If you're using the Enterprise Edition and you stop the contract, you by contract need to deinstall that. You can't continue running it. Yep. So it's not technical if it's some kind of business. It, 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 all kinds of work. Yep. Yeah. So then, what do enterprise customers want? Uh, typically, and this is a bit provocative again, but, but to generalize, mostly they want also no lock -in. They want it to be open source and often in database world, multiple databases in their infrastructure. They want it ideally for free. They want long-term maintenance and updates and things easy to use. It should scale very well. It should be robust and secure and private, data privacy and so forth. But they really, really would prefer not to pay for the software in their infrastructure stack. So, so yes, they can pay for some support and, and, and services and, and so forth, but ultimately they don't want to pay much. However, what the MongoDB examples and others have shown is that they are often ready to pay for a service. And, and that, what service means is kind of ultimate convenience that you really don't want to think about these things, that they should be managed automatically for you, you pay for that convenience. Yes, you could have people tweaking all these things, but you don't really want to do that. 
that. So, so, um, so that you are ready to pay for. And, and, and it's also kind of interesting, I have an extra slide at the end, uh, but, but how the, the age grouping of database administrators have changed. And you can probably, if you look online, you can find the same statistics, but it's quite interesting that 20 years ago, most DBAs were like between 20 and 30 years old. Today, about half of all the DBAs are over 40. <laughs> and between 20 and 30 year old, actually over 50 even. Between 20 and 30, it's like under 10 percent. I mean, in 30 and 40, it's like 17 or 15 percent. And, and so, the vast majority of the DBAs are already soon closing to retirement. <laughs> and, and, and the new generation, they don't. I'm sorry to be rude, Bob, but this is the VC mindset. They don't want to be spending time and hassle on this. They want a service that may, makes it work for them easily. Okay, but that's what I. I I admit it's a general kind of harsh generalization, but it's a bit of where the market is, is heading. So some, some kind of VC conclusions as an investor into software. It's hard to do big money on open source. Enterprises and the AWSs of the world, sorry to use that example today, AWS people, there's many others who use similarly open source for free. Uh, anyway, they want to let, get a lot of value for free. And, and they are really actually to devote quite a lot of effort to keep it so. So they can recruit people to do things and so forth, but not really to avoid getting into a scheme where they would have to pay licenses or so. So, so they want, they really want to, to keep it so. Um, with an open core model, you can create a small business. Uh, you typically, a cap comes often, and this is just based on the kind of track record last 20 years. Tens of millions maximum is a typical case. I think GitLab is the only one who has made with a kind of open core model significant revenue. Uh, so, so rarely in VC investment case. However, to really make money, uh, uh, this has been the case for the last 10 years, uh, startup really needs to provide a cloud service because customers are ready indeed to pay for the convenience. And but isn't one really making about half the money from enterprise licenses at this point? Yes. Years Yes, yes. It's true, but uh, still, I mean, the way it's deployed, to my understanding, but you know this better, but the way it's deployed in, in enterprises with the license in their stack, there's quite a lot of tools that make it like a own independent DB as a service for them. So it's a good question, I mean, how much is, is you need to then really be, I know, managing yourself so to say, but you know, you're right that it's an open core model, yes. Uh, because, uh, like, uh, you're right, and that's probably the mistake one that you made because you made MySQL too stable as a cloud product, kind of as a community product, and MariaDB, that, that in the early days, most people had a hard time actually running Mongo in production. So, so it ended up that you had kind of had to gravitate to the paid tiers to keep running it. So, so, so to some extent, one shouldn't make the product too good. <laughs> Sorry. I wonder about uh, getting a lot for free. Uh, do you see any difference uh, for the last two years in regard to this once uh, the recession hits the market? I think what I've heard is more and more uh, uh, founders of a business companies want to be more and more restrictive. They want to be much clearer on how to make money than before. Earlier, it was uh, like five years ago, we uh, met a lot of companies that were just thinking traction, 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 traction. Yes, you have a million of users, 10 million users, whatnot. And then we, then we find out how to make money. Today, and in the last few years, they have had a hard time to raise capital. Uh, you have to have a clearer view of how to make money. So people have moved increasingly to, to, to more restrictive licenses. I'm not really able to answer that. How many persons do you know who are paying for this example? You know any? How do they not make money? That's a good question. How many programmers? And that, and that exactly is uh, answering that question. Yeah. So the, so, we, yeah. yeah. So, with all the, I would say, hundreds of, of, of open source cases, investment cases, startups we looked at, 
uh, in the last five years or so. Uh, the biggest challenge is the following. Uh, those who are able to build an open source software distribution that gets a lot of traction, they are typically not the same persons who can define and create a superior cloud service for using it. And that, that's, it's just a ugly fact and that is unfortunately the, the case. Uh, the DNA for building a, an elegant experience kind of a SaaS service is different than building extraordinary software that really makes cool kind of technical stuff. So, so, so that is, is, is a large, large or a big challenge for successful open source founders out there. Uh, and only a few of these developers we meet understand the magnitude of the challenge. They often think that, well, I can hire a guy and he will code a front end something, whatnot. But it's, it's much more complicated than that to get actually a, a great service built and, 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 and the kind of distributed in the market. So, so I will come to that a bit on the next slide still. But one final note on conclusion is that, that, that we have been discussing internally, so where might the world be going? And, and also with this age grouping I mentioned, that gradually, you know, the new generation being kind of the 20 year old, already in, in some companies we meet half of the code is being produced by ChatGPT. <laughs> and, and, and gradually, probably nobody wants to touch any infrastructure ever. <laughs> So, so it might be that there's just this command you give, hey, make, make a database for this solution, and then the, whatever chat GPT uh, layer in between will understand based on the, the loads and data and whatnot, what type of database is needed, and they will set up such an instance, and it will be instantly scalable and very well managed, and the cloud service that you pay for. But you actually don't with your hands go there and ever choose it or touch it. It's just more or less provided to you based on the needs you have by logic in between. So think about that. That's a provocative thought, but maybe the world is going that way. And, and therefore, we all need to start thinking about um, 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 kind of how the cloud uh, generation or cloud movement will evolve to be even more automated and, and, and built uh, built and hidden and so forth. Anyway, final slide. So, a few recommendations. As a founder of an open source uh, software, uh, so to say, a uh, company, uh, not the founder of the software, of the company, sorry, uh, with growing popularity, you quite early you have to decide how big an ambition do you want to have. Uh, do you want to, is a service business okay? Is a 10 million revenue level, would you be fully satisfied with that? Or do you want to take the world and build a billion dollar in revenue? Uh, kind of your ambition level will quickly then determine for you how you should do things. I mean, how you should do with licensing, how you should think about building your company, who you should recruit, how you should take investor money perhaps, or all other things. So, so that is quite the only thing you need to decide because it steers then many of the, the subsequent, subsequent decisions. Uh, and then if you want to build a huge business with a popular open source uh, uh, distribution, uh, I would recommend, this is my view, uh, to get a co-founder with cloud experience from day one or day two, uh, or at least quickly get the key employees or advisors or even investor people who, who really know that part, because the likelihood is very high that you cannot do it yourself, unfortunately. Uh, some, some can, but not many. And then be restrictive of licensing, because otherwise others will come and eat your lunch. If not today, then when you become really popular, they will do it, and, and that's an unfortunate fact to, to be aware of. All right, thank you. Now I'm opening up for questions. Okay, so uh, one of the huge pieces that you forgot, if you have access to critical data that your applications needs to run, that you have copyright to, that nobody else can access, and you store that in the cloud, you can still do this. Yes, yes, and even increasingly so with the AI hype now, because the training data, if you have cool sets of data, that are proprietary and great, that means that will give you power in the future. So, so find ways to make the data side uh, kind of exciting and scaling and so forth, that we might invest from open ocean in your business. Yes? So, uh, would you basically say that the cloud is the future, and uh, more or less everything will go to the cloud? Well, yes, but the cloud is maybe the future today. And in 10 years, I said, cloud will mean that it's all 
you never really choose or manage it yourself. It's automated, hidden. It's it's okay, so, so it's more the automation that might be better. It's a service. So you services. On prem, you mean? Because that's basically what I did. Yes. Oh. Yeah, I think there will be. I mean, there will be versions. I mean, public cloud, private cloud. I mean, enterprises more and more will have private clouds, which more or less will run similar things as you see in the public cloud today. So it, the way of automation will be similar. So it, it, there will not be a big, it's a bit different, different how you distribute the software, how you put it up and running, how you manage, but more or less it will be similar software. So, yeah. so the lot of the automation and so on, that's actually a big part of the future. Well. Yes, yes, yes. Patrick, uh, question, do you have in your portfolio stories, the cases when, uh, say, initially proprietary software was in a successful, say, company? After making the part of the software open source become even more no no and I don't think it really can be done <laughs> that's my first view. Okay. There's many who have attempted oh let's you know we, we don't know how this you know, can be competitive or, or compete in the market or get popular or whatnot and people don't find it let's open source it and then it will work I not really seeing good examples of it those who build great open source kind of uh, software and get a lot of popular interaction, they do it from the start more or less, or very early on. Uh, because there's a lot of this kind of mentality in, in being open source that it's not just about, hey, the code is now open source. You have to have be, be active building the community, uh, have all this documentation, all the transparency, decision making, and bug fixes, and roadmaps, and this and that. So, so the way to get a vibrant community is critical, and uh, there's so many other things than just opening the code. So, how do you think data privacy regulation and other like hurdles like that will impact uh, AI startups in the next ten years? Well, <laughs> I'm afraid that China and the US, who are not so uh, hard on data privacy, will be able to build services that Europe will not be able to follow uh, because they are not strict on that privacy side. That being said, I. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's ways, probably ways, there are some ways in Europe we still can succeed in building great services there where it's respected and because it is respected, those will be the best services because the consumers will not accept them otherwise. But there will be some of both. But it's a big challenge. Yeah. Any questions? Some back there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I admit it, I mean, my view is a bit pessimistic, but I'm also provocative on a purpose here. But it's also from the point of view that, hey, as an investor, if I want to invest in something that builds 100 million in revenue, there are some already experience we've seen that, hey, this is typically the case. Yeah. Uh, from my consulting experience, we we can. That's why I have a client on my own company. Yeah. Because you also open source product. Yeah. Is to go to some clients and that wants to go in the cloud and tell them, okay, I, I do the same. I do my private cloud for you. Yeah. And we take revenue. We, we take shares of your, your company of the success of your company. Okay. And that's what we did with MySQL and MyRDB in the yeah. West building from small clients that becomes giants. Yes. And if we could, at some point, uh, build a company that had an open source product and get the shares from those clients that you specifically have, that would be a way to, to go out. Yes, yeah. I, I guess it's that, because the cloud they, will become more and more expensive. And, uh, <laughs> they, they raise the price that they want, so you, as a founder of a commercial company, yeah. someone that has an idea, okay, Chat, whatever. Uh, at the end, we give all this margin to the uh, to the cloud provider. Yeah. Yeah. There's a massive in the last few years, or even last one year, a massive kind of interaction startup now focusing on indeed how you can save on infrastructure cost, how you can optimize, how you can create kind of flexibility to be able to move between providers uh, so that that you can indeed negotiate much better and don't have the lock-in points. As to those move, they, they may be possible now, but in the future, uh, that's a, come back to full commercial lock-in. Uh, that's of course. I mean, <laughs> yeah, some 
forceful companies will try to get you locked in to be able to extract more revenue. And that's, so there's always that movement while there is a balancing movement where, hey, we should yeah, keep flexibility and ability to move and we should have kind of put it on your own servers even the whole cloud stack. But there's even startups that now focusing on, on kind of how you can put your own private cloud with your own server in the basement in a week and run most of things like it would be AWS. Uh, but, so this, there's all the time to both sides of the story. All right. Do you see fundamental differences in mentality between China and India on one side and Western countries on the other side related to open source, not primary investment? Because I think that's the same, but or do you not have inside the market there? I mean, or why are most of the open source projects coming from Western countries? Like Postgres in Europe, uh, Debian in Europe, MySQL in Scandinavia, etc. And not in Asia, not in other regions. I think it's because of, I mean, now if you look at 20 years or 20, 30 years back, it's because I think the culture in Europe has been collaborative, open-minded, kind of liberal, sharing, a bit of, you know, in, in, in US, I mean, in the early days in MySQL, in the US, many thought that MySQL, we're communists or socialists and we're destroying the business of software and yes. what on earth are you doing? And so the mentality is they're much more kind of just thinking money first, so to say, where there is, of course, in, in Europe tradition, there has been a more open minded culture. Access to computers. When I found the nature, people had access to computers around the day and no computer at home. Like one of them. And miles in the computer home in slightly more in Europe, actually. Half and half now. All right. Uh, I want to ask some more regarding uh, companies. I love to be in China, I love the engineers there, yeah. like engineers everywhere. But every single company that I visit and that they're like, here's the new features of, uh, let's say, enterprise or something that you are doing, like expand. Early question I get is when can we get that for free? <laughs> and I tell them that sorry, this will not be free. No, I don't get that. They don't basically they say they say that say in China. Not every company, all the company. If it's not free, we're not using it. And if it's free, you will not pay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. 